Hello, this is Reading Books Together, and I'm John Paul Jadamillo. And I'm Deborah Brothers, and this is our monthly podcast where we talk about books we're reading. Okay, we are back with our um, August pick, uh, our August pick that we're reading about or that we're talking about in September. That's, it was close. It was close. Um, close enough. Um, okay, so this month we're going to discuss uh, Woman of Light. Uh, so, Deborah, we both read through this book over the past month. Uh, I probably read it, I think I read it probably before you did, so I haven't had to review my notes because I think I finished this book like a week and a half, two weeks ago, but we're teachers, we're starting school again, and so we haven't had all that much time, but we said that before that we discuss um, uh, Kali Fajardo, uh, Anstein's book woman of light that maybe we would talk about just reading in general a little bit sure um whatever you want yeah so um so uh ted borsey who we both know he does a lot of um like youtube lectures Mm -hmm. and anyway he gave a lecture and he said that reading is dead and um i always give kind of a icebreaker discussion with my students the first week uh, we're almost, we're like in week three now, but in week one, everyone in my class is admitted to not reading. That includes my creative writing students. Hmm. Um, so this is a reading podcast. Um, what do you think about, um, well, I have uh, heard, I mean, you said, what do you think, think about, but I, I'll jump in with what you just said. I have heard we are moving from a reading culture to a writing culture. So, <clears throat> what do you think I, about that? I, I think that's probably true, but I also think a lot of people don't see themselves as writers or don't see themselves doing writing either. So it makes me wonder, you know, the trajectory of that. But, and and since they work so closely together, I don't understand how we can kind of make that declaration while at the same time I can kind of see it and and I know my students always say too that they don't read very much they're not used to reading it tires them out they don't read quickly and they don't really like reading for the most part I mean you know run into some people who do yeah so it's not that they don't like narratives or they don't like stories because I think you know maybe it has something to do with the with the medium or the the idea of of the book, uh, as opposed to the idea of um, movies, TV shows, streaming, everything. But um, yeah, I, I I used to think that you know, oh, young people aren't reading and they're not thinking about stories, you know, and that means that they're not going to be. You know they're going to have a they're going to be behind when they try to write stories when they try to write short stories or when they try to write a novel or something. But um, so I'm teaching this book, um, consider this by Chuck Palahniuk, uh, and uh, he says that he believes that young people uh, are m- more um, uh, are more articulate are are uh, are are better off because they've been, um, you know, they've been reading, they've, they've been seeing, they've been experiencing every kind of narrative structure through media. And he also writes that, you know, that some stories are best told in certain, mm-hmm. you know, certain mediums. So he's <clears> like, <throat> why would you write a short story about dancing? 
<laughs> you know, sure. when you can, you know, when you should make a short film or something about dancing or about well, music or something right. like that. Right. I mean, and this, this yeah. is book that we're going to discuss this month. It seems particularly important because when she was taught, you know, I watched some interviews like as I always do before a podcast. And she said that it's important that these stories be documented she felt it was important to her that these stories be documented in the form of a uh, form of a, a book. So I, I feel like that it's not that young people are, you know, dumb. Uh, I just think that maybe it's the the lack of popularity of the of the novel or of the of, of books. Right. I mean, I think too. You know, just that idea that um, we don't. Maybe partly the pandemic has contributed, I don't know, in, to that in some ways because people were shut down and kind of shut in for a while and now a lot more people are getting out and doing, I mean, some people have been that way all along, but a lot more people are doing some of the things that they missed out on, you know, before. So maybe the idea of being kind of, you know, reading feels like a solitary experience. It feels like an an isolating experience sometimes, you know, especially I think for people who don't read a lot. And so maybe they're just not as willing to, right now to subject themselves to that when they want to be more social and kind of out in the world. Go to the movies, but yeah. But um, yeah, I like physical books, but um, you know, maybe, maybe more and more folks are reading books on their phones or eBooks. Like I have this particular book, Woman of Light as an eBook. Mm -hmm, and I kind too. of missed out on having a physical copy, but I just feel like when you deal with lots of books and lots of texts, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to carry around three, four or five, you know, books with you. It's so much easier just to pull up, you know, something it, on your it, it reader is. or your phone. And it's easier in some ways. I mean, it's, it's easier to highlight, but it's not easier to make notes. So, um, I mean, with an ebook, it's easier to highlight, and then you can retrieve them, you know, all at once. But but I really like to write, you know, in books. I really like to annotate and and write my reactions and things. And I find that I'll highlight, but I won't like then type in a note. And I don't know why that is, but I don't have so I don't have any notes actually on this book. But I do have, um, you know, something I highlighted. But maybe we should just get right to to the book. So this might be the most recent book right. that we've read. I think that's what we were talking about. That this mm -hmm. book was released just this June. Mm -hmm. And um, the author, this is her first novel. Her short story collection was called uh, Sabrina and Karina. That came out in 2019. So um, even though I read an interview that said that she had the novel before the collection of short stories, that she was sitting on it, that she created that collection and that collection, every article I'm reading says that it's acclaimed because I guess it was a um, National Book Award finalist, hmm. I think. Um, anyway, um, should we do a quick summary and then just talk about you know what what we liked? Sure. Um, so I like this book a lot. It's kind of in my wheelhouse. I mean, it's uh, she's a Colorado author. Uh, and she's, um, uh, you know, a Denver author. And so uh, I'm a Colorado author. I'm not from Denver, but I'm from Colorado. I'm from Southern Colorado. Uh, and this book was multi-generational family story. Um, I think the, the write-up says it goes back, it tells the story of five generations of this particular family uh, I keep wanting to say in my notes the Lopez family because Luce's name is Lopez but uh, 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 but my notes aren't that detailed I guess but um, so but the main character is uh, a teenager so would you consider I don't know if you would consider this a young adult book um, it's like a teenage um, main character and she uh, she kind of has, I think the chapters are sort of organized around visions uh, that she is having about her, about her family. So I think it stretches from like 1890 to 
like the 1930s, right? So um, uh, I like the idea that, um, you know, that it's mainly in like Depression era uh, Denver and it has a lot of the backdrop. There's a lot of history of Colorado, a lot of history of Denver. Uh, but every section is sort of edited or organized um, to give us like different time periods, different generations of mm -hmm. this particular family, which I really like just going back to our conversation about like medium, like um, a multi-generational story seems like, I guess you could do it in film, like flashbacks or something for like, like Godfather two style, right? Where you have flashbacks. But I think that story of like many, uh, many perspectives, many family members, I think it works really well for the novel. Right. And again, I've seen interviews where she says that these are family stories, that these are stories that from an oral history of her family that she put together, um, and that she wanted to collect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, you know, in book form. And I sort of feel the exact same way that they're like my, my writing are sort of like family stories. Um, but of course, um, you know, they're fictionalized. There's a lot of fiction. There's a lot of things that I've seen in interviews that she says that, uh, or that I've seen in interviews, she says that she gave each character, each perspective, sort of their own kind of dominion. Uh, so she had like the bare bones of the story. Um, but you know, so it's, you know, it's not an oral history project. It is, right. um, right, it fiction. is fiction. So there are a lot of situations that were not from family stories. She says that, um, that she, um, that she fictionalized, but I guess we could just, you know, focus in on our main character and that's essentially who we spend a lot, a lot of time with, you know, a teenager, uh, growing up in, uh, growing up in Denver. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, her name is Luce and she, uh, kind of has this power. She's like kind of clairvoyant. She has this power of, mm, of seeing page. things. She's a seer, right? And I was thinking about like the poet as seer, uh, or the writer as seer, the someone who has insight into these stories. Uh, and again, each section is sort of organized through kind of a vision, which I thought was, you know, as a structural device, I like that a lot. And she, so she goes from like reading tea leaves. I think she's the first time we see her, she's reading tea leaves. Um, uh, uh, to getting more legit jobs. And, uh, and I want to say like just the feel of Denver, just getting a sense of the past. It does feel like she did her, did some research, did a lot of research, did her history homework. And so we get this feel of like, um, 1930s Denver felt really interesting to me. And also the idea of like city and country, which is something that I always try to do. Um, you know, in my writing is that she has family members from the 1890s, which would have been like a West, like a, a wild West or kind of like a, um, um, kind of rural living and then to city living. So literally we see like the family, living in what she calls the, uh, you know, Southern Colorado, uh, and, uh, and Denver. Um, I, I really liked that, um, you know, that the story in Denver gave us this kind of perspective on just the complexity of, um, the history of Colorado or which I always talk about cause I'm from Colorado. And so I always talk about how, the politics of Northern Colorado and Southern Colorado. And she refers to Southern Colorado where I'm from as the lost territory. And, um, which, you know, when I read it, I thought I don't, you know, I'm from Pueblo, Colorado. I'm from where, you know, near where for no County. Uh, and I had never heard that. And that construction is kind of her, fictionalization or kind of like her just she talked a lot about um like Faulkner making up counties like everyone talks about Faulkner making up counties uh and so she made up 
she made up a town that I guess appears in in her book Sabrina and Karina, and um, oh yeah, so she's kind of made up uh, a southern a southern Colorado, even though there are particular names and places mm-hmm. sort of named, uh, but she's she's made up, you know. Which I found particularly, which I found interesting, but um, uh, yeah. So I always think of Northern Colorado, Denver, Colorado, as um, like Colorado split in half. I always think of like Southern Colorado being like more of a New Mexico feel and Northern Colorado feeling just just more, you know, just feeling a lot different. And the Denver becoming the capital has a lot of politics and behind it. Uh, and, uh, in many ways it's like kind of screwing over those in the San Luis Valley where my family's also from because they can't, you know, they can't get to the North, uh, they can't get to Denver fast enough to, um, you know, to be represented in government. And, uh, you know, I've read a lot of books on like the history of Colorado. And so you have Northern, Northern Colorado kind of being the political stronghold of power and then Southern Colorado kind of being, um, more rural sort of feeling so um uh, so you get that kind of history and you get that kind of movement from south to north which is um uh i don't know it's just it's like a book just for me like a book made for just you know because i know she's a colorado writer and it felt like it felt primarily uh like a denver book um and the the you know and then the most of the stuff in southern colorado is kind of uh, fictionalized kind of made up, Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, so I, I really like the, the movements in time. I'm big on time jumps. So I like the like movement and, you know, forward and backward in time from section to section or chapter to chapter. Um, and I liked that, um, you know, I like that, that we get a little bit of, you know, u.s u.s history and so a lot of the things that i'm reading i wrote down like we get like um uh the ku klux klan we get segregation we get like race racism we get racial violence um police police issues police violence yeah Mm -hmm. and um and um and sexism (laughs) so i was just like writing down like broad themes that you know Mm -hmm. um um uh, that kind of um i kind of want to say that 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 shows us Luce's life and her family that like illuminates her family and a lot of the reviews that i was reading were kind of critical of like focusing on this one particular character and how maybe we don't get enough about her but I think kind of the point is that we get her family and and so what builds her is as important as who she who she is. And I kind of have accused of that uh, as well. But, you know, I wonder what it is about um, Latinos or indigenous like folks with indigenous, uh, you know, uh, family members that they that they're or maybe just everybody wants to know um about their family and I think so. and sure. like Maxine Honkington says she wants um uh, uh, ancestral help <laughs> so uh I sure. I felt like you know she was kind of um having these visions of like her ancestors of like ancestral help but so yeah so what 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 did you think or what was your take I really liked the opening and I liked that whole first section and I was so caught up in that historical section like where you know I think that Pedra is that how you would pronounce the name yeah the baby and how he you know comes to the the ancestor you know the the second great grandfather or whatever how he comes to be and how you know I loved that section so much that it was really difficult for me to do the time jump to the next section because I wanted more about that and and it just kind of went you know we it's like we see him as a baby and as a very young kid with the woman who adopts him and 
that's really interesting and she's really interesting and I wanted more about her, you know, then too. And then she dies and then suddenly he's leaving, you know, right? And and I was a little disappointed with that. But then, it, and so it was hard for me at first. I, I stopped after that and then I put the book down for probably a month and then came back to it and reread it and thought, okay, you need to get over your resistance to this and just go with how the book is is set up and then I liked it you know better like the second time through I was like okay now I now I get it you know um you know and there were things that I really liked about it I mean I loved this this is just in the prologue in that first part but this this is a line that I had highlighted Spanish had once spilled a bucket of Catholicism over the land I mean I thought that was a really um interesting you know way of saying that you you asked earlier or you said you know like is it a young adult book well, i mean and you know whether a book is young adult or not has a lot lot to do has probably more to do with how it's marketed than how it is written but the things that i would say that keeps this from being a young adult novel is the fact that while the focus of the book is on Luce, the the whole book's not about her. And and I and while I liked what you just said about the fact that it's it's as important to know about you know the factors and the family stories that make Luce who she is as it is to know more about her. I really liked that you said that and I would also say that this isn't a building's room in the sense that it is and it isn't but but it isn't in the sense that we we're left at the end with just kind of this vision of the future and this new baby named lucy right i mean again that the light you know loose means light right i mean and lucy would mean this the same thing and and so i felt a little um ripped off I guess so because I want to know her more and I don't feel like I know her more I feel like I know one part of her you know and I know about her kind of sexual awakening and her sensual awakening and her romantic yearnings but I don't really know about her and so that that was disappointing to me, um, I will say. So other things that I liked, though, you know, I, although I really don't like snakes in real life, I was totally fascinated by Diego and his snakes and that whole story of how he came to have the snakes and then what happened and then how he has to kill them and you know, and, uh, or feels like he has to kill them. And, and then he ends up with another snake, you know, at the end and, you know, one little snake. And, um, I, I found that really weirdly odd, but also interesting, you know, especially when he would do like calisthenics and the snakes would be on his back. I, I mean, and that's really random, but I mean, that's just something that, that I think, one of the things that she does the best is description. You know, I, I would say her description's stronger than her characterization. And, and that, um, and setting that place, you know, even if it is an imagined place, she's, and it is. I mean, people can call something historical, you know, fiction, they can call it historical realism. And it is historical realism. But historical realism and fantasy are exactly the same <laughs> in the sense that, that you have to create that world, you know? And so um, you are creating a world that, I mean, she wasn't alive in the 1930s. So, you know, this author is creating this world. So it is fantasy in that sense. And 
so she has to be good at world building and that means she has to be good at setting and and description of setting so you know you said you were drawn in but to that and i was too I, and she's she is good at at establishing setting and establishing that feel for the world that she's created whether or not it's an accurate representation I, who knows you know i think it feels a little forward sometimes i think it feels a little too much filtered through 21st century you know uh, sensibility for me but at the same time i also know that that most of the media that was that we had you know and still do but most of the media that we had like newspapers of that era they were um the ones that we hear about the ones that were the big you know reports and everything and that that were kind of taken as factual were run by white people and so um they had a tendency to not report or not report positively on anybody who was you know indigenous or anybody who was you know latino or anybody who was any ethnicity or any racial classification other than white and so um again is it too forward were people really think you know i obviously they were we had you know we had people protesting laws and protesting systems of injustice of injustice 100 years ago just as we do now you know but so maybe that's my reading as a white person that made me think you know wait a minute wait a minute this is this is too progressive you know people weren't that progressive i mean they absolutely could have been so it's interesting you know though i i enjoyed it i'm glad i read it um and yeah thanks for thinking of it and i think there are some things about it that were, that did resonate with me like as far as your writing um some of the, some similar similarities just random things like um a sign and then like telling me exactly what it said on that sign you know and the sign appearing kind of in its sign form in the in the book um so i thought that was interesting but what i know of the world you set up in your books with your characters and what i know of you know then like kind of doing a comparative thing yeah i would say that the the pueblo huerfano um as lost territory it makes me wonder does she mean lost in the sense that nobody that everybody's forgotten it which obviously they haven't or does she mean lost in the sense of kind of this romantic version that it was this time when there was this great possibility and then that got lost so so that that's that's kind of interesting that she used that designation yeah i think she means it as like uh a couple of things like i mean i mean i i mean literally i think she means it as like the land that mexico lost um but i also think she means it as kind of like a metaphor for like the history of her family that yeah. they were born there and then they traveled north to you know uh to denver and that makes um, sense um yeah but you know i just i think you know i talk about this all the time like that San Luis was settled in 1850. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. you know, in my family, you know, you, you helped do the, the research of like, you know, the Montoya mm -hmm. family's always sure. been in New Mexico and Colorado. And so I've been fond of saying like the border crossed that family, mm -hmm. the family didn't cross the border. <laughs> so it's sort of, you know, so yeah, so it's my, my take on lost territory is a little different than, mm -hmm. than her take, but I sort of took it as like a metaphor but you know i mean i i have these thoughts that that northern colorado doesn't always have a lot of respect for southern colorado for mm -hmm. lots of different reasons and it could be like country mouse city mouse kind of stuff like the characters in the south here are living completely different lives than you know in the past and those in the mm -hmm. in the city even just within my own family you know from the san luis valley working on farms and ranches and then going to cities to mm -hmm to work in offices to type and, or to, you know, do, you know, do laundry. But 
you know, the, the history of her family, you know, she tells it in a pretty realist way. And I was like, when you were saying that, you know, it feels it's fiction, but it feels very realist. And I was thinking, and when I saw an interview with her, she says, I'm, you know, I was reacting to her MFA program where everyone's trying to telling her to be experimental. Mm. And I took that as like, also as, um, like she didn't want to be magical. Right. And so there isn't a lot of magic in here, even in the person that's told to us that has even magic. In the leaves, yeah. It does. It, yeah. And so, but I just, yeah. I, I took the, the chapters of the visions as being the magic or mm. being the visions mm-hmm. that she's having, you know, that, that are, you know, and maybe I read into it a lot from the way that I write that like this is this may not be told directly, but this is coming from that main character's perspective I, or I, story yes. from that main character. And I think this um, idea, I'm sorry, I, I'm cutting you off because I'm excited, but go ahead and finish out your idea. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say for me that I loved how she talked about reading the tea leaves and how at first Luce is only seeing like kind of like blobs and shapes and then that changes for her as she gets a little older she starts seeing actual people she sees things happening right she kind of sees possibilities and I think that's what it's a metaphor for it's not and you're right to me it doesn't feel though it doesn't feel woo woo it doesn't feel like it feels very normal it feels very real in the sense that it, it doesn't feel fantastic. It just feels like somebody who's young, who's got hopes and yearnings and longings and you know, for the past as well as the future. We didn't mis- mention that she and Diego are abandoned by her, her parents basically and that her aunt's raising them. And, and, that, and so she thinks of that time before with her father and mother and then Diego even finds his grave then later, right? And, and toward the end. And, and um, so she's yearning for that, for that past and that stability and those stories. She's yearning for stories. So what does she do? She makes stories and she sees stories or she sees things. And I think it's just kind of a metaphor for what we all do you know, with our hopes and dreams and, and how it becomes this way for her to not just yearn for the past or yearn for the future but to be okay with where she is right now and to use that as a a way to um envision a future too though you know because i mean i think sometimes it's hard when we've been traumatized or when we've had bad things happen to us or when we don't feel real stable to sometimes it's hard to see that that future and so it ends on this kind of unresolved note in the sense that we don't know, we, you know, we're still seeing Luce at like 18 and we don't really know, you know, what she's going to do or what she's going to be, except that she's going to be an aunt <laughs> or she is an aunt, like her aunt, and that um, she's going to share a hand in raising this baby, at least for a while, uh, and she's going to um, make sure that child knows, you know, the family stories and they're on a new route because now at least, you know, um, Maria Josie is, is, uh, the aunt, she's kind of out, you know, right? She's gay and she's, her lover is with them, you know, Edna or Edith, I can't remember the woman's name, but, um, and they're this family then at that point, you know, they're like a, a reunited family back together. Diego's back and they're, they're on a, a route toward the future. So that, so that the tea read or the leaves reading the visions, whatever, I mean, it literally gave her a vision, you know, to be able to see something outside of being married at that time or, you know, whatever it's it's a, a possibility for something else and i think the you know the seeing the the family seeing the persistence of family i think that's enough of a vision or that's enough of like mm-hmm. magic 
vision, right. I guess. There. Yeah. Um, that's, that's cool. And what I, you know, for me, you know, cause you know, Latinos in workshops, cause I know are always, she said ex- she was pushed in a workshop to be more experimental and to write short stories and, you know, rather than a novel. And I always felt in a workshop, people push you to, you know, you know, if you're Latino to be magical mm. and, uh, you know, but I, I also appreciated in, in her interviews, she said that, um, you know, that she wanted to tell stories that weren't filtered through, uh, through white folks, uh, you know, that she want, you know, she, that she wanted to tell, you know, stories from her family and not have it filtered through, uh, you know, a white author. Mm. And she called out a bunch of like Southwestern authors that I l- l- like or love but yeah they have a lot of problems with them like like willa cather like the one that like mm-hmm. she's like she's like i love willa cather like i love willa cather too but the again like it's the the point of view is always uh a white point of view mm-hmm. and it's always like or it's a european point of view mm-hmm. like or it's uh you know so it, it's always like um you know uh an out a dominant outsider <laughs> Mm. Uh, rather than like these are like a story stories from uh you know uh from insiders and um you know that's why i always that's why i appreciated um you know i appreciated a lot of the stories um and and she also said something interesting in interview she said that um you know that the stories are important and that the characters drive the stories uh as opposed to you know, uh, an agenda or something like that. But I think, but I think wanting to, wanting to tell the stories of Colorado that are not told from a white Mm -hmm. perspective is, you know, is great, is, is, is huge. And, you know, and it's it's a huge press. I mean, this is not like it's, you know, this is, um, you know, the, the other Latino authors that, that I've read or that we've talked about, they've always been independent presses. And this is like penguin random house is like a huge Mm -hmm. one. And I, I wonder after the American dirt backlash, if this was a writer, this was a book that was maybe like a course correction for a big company's like, I don't know, but she thinks Sandra Cisneros. Um, yeah. And we can, yeah. Sandra Cisneros, loved American dirt, thought it was mm-hmm. the best thing. And, but mm-hmm. you know, we could talk about that so some other time. Maybe we'll read American dirt or I don't know, maybe we'll at least, you know, talk about it or, but, um, uh, okay. So, um, pick up this book if you have the opportunity. So uh, what are we reading for, uh, this well, month, I mean for, next month. Well, for later, later this month, because again, going back just to what we were saying at the beginning, August kind of wore us out, and and uh, we were preparing for school, and we didn't get our podcast out in time. So we're actually doing two this month. So we're doing this one, and then later this month, toward the end, we're going to do. Um, also, getting back to our earlier conversation, where you were talking about forms of stories and what forms work best for which stories. We're going to do something which is a little weird for a podcast, but we're going to talk about a picture book. So we'll put some visual representations of that, you know, like um, on the blog pages and stuff, just so people can see some illustrations. So what's but, the particular? So book? we are doing *Radiant Child* by Javaka Steptoe, which is a biographical picture book of Jean-Michel Basquiat, and it's um, came out. Five ish years ago, and uh, I really think it's it's phenomenal. Is it children's literature? Yes, it is. So we get that added kind of cool thing to get to talk about. So picture okay. book, children's literature, and um, nonfiction. Okay. And I'll just I'll just date this August. Nobody will know. <laughs> Let's date this August. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, thank you, and I'll see you in a month, Deborah. <laughs>